Hey everyone, today we'll be talking about my favorite band of all time. As you might be able to tell from the shirt, we're going to be talking about the Beatles. I've been listening to their albums all week to try to come up with this list, and let me tell you, it's been hard to come up with the cream of the crop. Gun to my head, if you ask me what my favorite Beatles album was, I might say The White Album or Revolver. Neither of them make the top 10. That just goes to show they have so many great songs. I'm calling this, undeniably, the top 10 best Beatles songs. And for a little bit of fun, we'll also have one overrated song. And let me tell you, it's one of their big singles, so you'll want to stay tuned here. In the meantime, let's get to the 10 best. Let's get started. Starting it off at number 10, we have A Day in the Life, the epic conclusion to Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Now this is the epitome of a closing song. I couldn't imagine any song that could possibly go after this. Like at the very end, the orchestra comes back and it ends with those two piano chords. Ba ba. Like how are you going to follow that? Y you can't do it. It even comes after the reprise of the Sgt. Pepper's theme, so it sounds like it's almost the closing of a show or the closing of a movie. With its epic orchestral work, it just makes it sound so majestic. Even afterwards, there's this kind of really annoying loop that they decided to put on the vinyl that just loops and loops forever, so they ensured that you wouldn't immediately just turn it over and start the album again. It just feels like it needs a break to kind of absorb even after the song's done. What's interesting about A Day in the Life in the context of Sgt. Pepper's is Sgt. Pepper's, after a long time of John and Paul really collaborating on songs, Sgt. Pepper's is probably the first album where you basically hear, that's a John song, that's a Paul song. It even continues in A Day in the Life, only the difference is it's basically two a John and a Paul song smushed together, and with that chaotic, orchestral swell kind of bridging the two. But they're both A-plus songs. The way they marry together is incredible. They do evoke a day in the life. John's part being about just reading these kind of dreary, mundane headlines from the paper. Paul is more of like a literal point of view, his day, getting up, going through the motions. They both put their slice of a day in the life into this epic song. The musicianship during Sgt. Pepper's was incredible. They were at the height of their power. They had quit touring, so they had nothing but time. You could imagine poor Ringo getting pretty bored back there, but they did it all for a reason. The recording to this day just sound magical. There was so much care taken into absolutely every aspect of it. From the jangly guitars that build it up, to John's ghostly vocals, those shuffling drums that just kind of carry it along. You couldn't talk about the song without talking about, of course, the, the orchestra in the middle that just brings it up. Paul just told them to basically play everything from as low as possible, the, the lowest note you could, to the highest note you could, and didn't tell them the speed at which to play it. So you just hear these accomplished musicians fumbling through this. The transition between, I read the news today, and I woke up, got out of bed, Paul's piece. There's nothing quite like it. It's been repeated since. It's very influential. A piece of avant-garde orchestral music in the middle of this pop song. I wasn't alive in 1960, but I'm sure it was very different from what we came before. It might be one of the weirdest songs that still gets played on pop radio today. It's a magnificent achievement. It's definitely one of their best. It's an incredibly strong start to this list. At number 9 we have I Saw Her Standing There from the first Beatles album, Please Please Me. Now, there are some people that love early Beatles and there are some people that love the more experimental, late, hippie Beatles. I don't think you have to be mutually exclusive there. To like one more is kind of like a false binary to me. There's no reason that you have to be on one side or the other. They both make amazing songs. Even at the beginning, Lennon and McCartney were already miles above their peers. As the first song on Please Please Me, it's really a burst of energy. Between the excited hand claps and the urgent bass line, there's just so much energy in the song. So much exuberance. You could imagine how they were so exciting to see back in the day live, these young musicians making this raucous. It's a lot of fun. It might not be the most sophisticated song they ever wrote, 
but it's a rollicking good time. It's just a song that makes you want to get up and dance. There's a reason that Paul still plays it today. The interplay between the instruments is exceptional. You could see that they were really working as a team at the time. The exuberance and the energy and spirit, you could hear why they became such a sensation and while Beatlemania really caught fire. It's all summed up there and I saw her standing there and it stands the test of time. At number eight, we have George's only song on this list, Something. Unfortunately, Here Comes the Sun, also a great song, did not make the top 10. Something holds the distinction of being the only George Harrison number one. It is on the number one Beatles album. Here Comes the Sun actually might be just as popular nowadays. At the time, it just didn't hit those numbers. Something is a timeless love song. It's gorgeous. It seems like George had literally waited his entire Beatles career to make something like this. Now don't get me wrong, George had written some great songs, whether it be Tax Man or whether it be While My Guitar Gently Weeps, still amazing songs. To me, it's the best song George has ever written, and it really seems like the culmination of learning. He was kind of the student of the Beatles. He was learning so much from John and Paul, you know, he started when he was 16, 17 in that band. You know, you're hardly formed as that. He learned so much by the time something came around. It really is the best he's ever done. Between the plaintive, soft-spoken lyrics, the lovely orchestration by George Martin, I think Ringo's drumming is incredibly underrated. The bridge, he's a monster on it. Those drum fills just sound so epic, so dramatic. This is a song that's three minutes long, but it sounds like it's a symphony. There are still orchestras that play this today and they'll play it for six, seven minutes. It's a three minute song. The melody is so perfect. It just captures the feeling he has. What I like about the lyrics is I think they speak to the theme of the song which is that love is kind of hard to capture in words. You're asking me where my love grows, I don't know. It's almost as if he can't articulate what it is that brings him back to this lover, but he's trying to, and the best way he can express that is through the music. Because a song, it's just underrated how well the rhythm section is between the drumming and the bass lines. The melody is so delicate and the song is absolutely beautiful. It's still a stunner after all these years. It's so hard to do a list like this. How is every song one of my favorite songs? That's just the Beatles for me at least. At number seven, we have Strawberry Fields Forever from Magical Mystery Tour. Now, if you've ever seen Magical Mystery Tour, the film, you know it's a mess. And the album, honestly, it's not a whole lot better. It's kind of like a mishmash of songs they had at the time, and you could probably tell that they were partying a little too much. It didn't stop them from making some amazing singles, Maybe not everything was perfect, maybe not everything was timeless, but Strawberry Fields Forever is absolutely one of their best. It is a dream. It is so trippy. Really the pinnacle, the absolute peak of the Beatles using the studio as an instrument itself. The final single of Strawberry Fields that you hear is cut from two completely separate takes. They did one take, they liked that part, and then at some point they did another take and they liked that ending way more. So what they had to do was actually sync it by slowing the one version down and kind of just putting it together. The fact that it came together like it did is a minor miracle. Nowadays you could just put that in a computer, put one track next to another track, line it up, that's the end of the story. But back then it's a technical marvel that they managed to put two completely different songs together in one and it's seamless. It's the kind of song where you couldn't even play it that way back in the day. Perhaps nowadays you could trigger some samples or you could tour with an entire orchestra, but back then it would be impossible to play a song like that. The sound of the Mellotron really announces the world that this brief song brings you into. The lyrics from John's childhood are both memorable and besides the point, loosely giving you references to kind of evoke this feeling of visiting his child home, but it's not what it used to be. Kind of this mindset of bringing you into another world where it's familiar, but it's a new world. It's something you have to experience again. The feeling in the song is personal. It's abstract. It's kind of everything at once. It's a magical song. It's hard to imagine such a psychedelic song that is still so well thought of it's not a guy zonked out of his mind. 
it's a great song that's expanded by the use of psychedelics, expanded by the use of psychedelia. It really captures the time, and there's no song quite like it. At number six, we have Ticket to Ride from Help. Now, Ticket to Ride is a deceivingly simple song, but I think what it really shows is that the Beatles were embracing more experimental music. They were really trying to push the boundaries of where they had been brought to. At the time, Beatlemania and rock and roll in general seemed so Chuck Berry, Buddy Holly. It has a certain style, and they didn't want to be that band. They wanted to experiment. They wanted to stretch their wings, if you will. They wanted to get better, and they wanted to make new things. It seems like like it's kind of like an old-fashioned song. It's a little different. The reason why it seems so weird is, is it has those off-kilter drumming from Ringo. It's not the typical rock beat of the time, and the guitar's jangliness kind of drone on. This almost avant-garde droning that continues throughout the song. It just rings out. It really carries the song. It also has exceptional harmony vocals, which is really a trademark of their early work. It really makes the song so singable. There's a reason that every time a Beatles song comes on, it seems more singable than maybe other songs. I think it's because the sound of two people singing at once in harmony is so appealing to the human ear, and it just makes you want to join in. The lyrics, for the time, it's even a little pro-feminist? She's got a ticket to ride, but she don't care. He's pining after this girl that he wishes would stick around, but she says that living with him is bringing her down. So she's an independent woman, and she's going her own way. For that time and day, that's kind of progressive, actually. It has that nice pickup with the tambourine during the chorus. I don't know why she riding so hard. She ought to think twice. She ought to do right. It kind of veers between that tilted droning verse and the exciting pickup during the bridge. And it really wraps up in a fun way where, and she don't care, they kind of vamp and jam out at the end, which is really fun. And it's a really fun way to bring it home. Coming in at number five, we have Can't Buy Me Love from Hard Day's Night. At barely over two minutes long, it's hard to believe you could write such a perfect, short, concise pop song. It's timeless. It starts with those joyous vocals and then just goes right into the song, barely thinking twice. It's hard to find a song that sounds so happy and upbeat without being trite or sentimental. It's a song that feels justified in its happiness. It feels like he's in the throes of the honeymoon period of a relationship. And it's so happy and it brings him such joy that he just has to speak about it. In Hard Day's Night, during the video sequence, they're basically jumping around on trampolines and that's kind of the feeling of joy that you get from the song. It's jaunty, it's peppy, it hits that soft spot of being sweet and kind of cheeky. I don't care too much for money. Obviously he cares about money. He's talking about that this love is just that great to him that he has to sing and shout about it. And he gotta love the Paul shout at the bridge. Ow! <laughs> it's just classic Paul. Really gets you into the song. Oldies song or not, Can't Buy Me Love is still an absolute classic. At number four, we have Yesterday from Help. At one point, it was the most covered song of all time. I'm not sure if that's still the case, but I could imagine it. I imagine people will sing this Love Lorne song at karaoke till the end of time. Yesterday, obviously, it's a pop standard. There's a reason. The feeling is universal. It's wistful. It's thinking about old times, really reminiscing about times that were better. For Paul, it really, at the time, was bold. It was ambitious. I mean, they were the foursome that would go out there and play rambunctious rock and roll songs. So for him to put down his bass, pick up the guitar, go center stage and just sing this song with just him and some backing strings, it was quite risky. It took a lot of courage, honestly, to do it because it's just not what the Beatles were known for, but it's where they wanted to go. It's where they wanted to grow. The fact that a man in his 20s could write such deep, lovelorn song about the past. When you're older, you're like, how old was he? <laughs> you know, what was he thinking about the age of 20? To write such a deep, soulful song that's so universal, like even beyond English, between the melody and kind of the way it sounds, people could really 
just interpret what the song is about and what it means to them. I mean, it's such a widely covered song that I imagine there's countries that love that song and they barely even know what it's truly about. That feeling is so present in the song that you kind of already know. It's just shorthand of the song itself. Now famously, Paul came up with it in his sleep, is what he says, and he would play it for people and basically ask if they knew what the song even was. And they would tell him, I don't know what that song is. He would just keep playing it to people until he finally realized he just came up with that song. What a song to dream of. Could you imagine? I could barely remember my dreams now. If I dream up something like that, that's, that's a gift. He also originally titled the song Scrambled Eggs. So I could not imagine that what the lyrics would have been if he went forward with scrambled eggs as the original lyrics. He didn't. Instead, he wrote what has become a classic pop standard, and for absolute good reason, it is a timeless song and will be with us forever. Coming in at number three is In My Life from Rubber Soul. Now, I feel like Yesterday and In My Life are kind of similar in an extent. If Yesterday was Paul's lament of lost innocence, lost love, th there's that feeling also inherent in In My Life. It's once again a man in his early 20s reminiscing, even though, you know, what do you have to reminisce about? In this sense, he's reminiscing to the lover who is still with him. In, in his life, he loves you more. It does have this melancholy feeling where he's thinking about what came before and what shaped him into who he is now. As a really famous person, in his life, he's kind of reminiscing about times when things were easier. It wasn't so stressful to be a Beatle. It has that kind of sepia tones to it. He thinks of it fondly. What carries him through is this person's love. Through all of that, he has so much affection, so much love for those times, and it shaped him who he is today. Through all that, he's glad he made it and he's glad he has this person in his life to share it with. The music is fairly simple, fairly straightforward. Some understated rhythm between the bass and drums. The highlight is probably the harmonies between Paul and John. I mean, no one does oohs and ahs quite like that band did at the time. It really just accents the arrangement. George Martin's harpsichord solo is probably, maybe it's the only harpsichord solo of all time. I don't know if any other one offhand. It really somehow works in the favor of the song. It ties it together. It almost reminds me of a music box, which kind of helps that vibe. It almost sounds like a time capsule. Oftentimes, Paul has talked about how he's the sentimental one in the group. I mean, he wrote silly love songs. He has songs that prove that he can get kind of sappy, but this shows that John also was a big softy. He has a big sweet spot for his family and his friends. He wants to express that love and he wants to show what the love he gets means to him and he wants to sh share that love as well. In the end, it's timeless and it's a perfect song. At number two, we have Across the Universe. Across the Universe, I don't think had the greatest reception when it was originally released. Originally, it was released as a charity single. You could hear that on Past Masters 2 where for some ungodly reason they decided to put birds cawing on the song itself. And then after that, the next time it was released, it was released on Let It Be, only after the Beatles had already broken up. So it has Phil Spector's overly dramatic doo-wop strings on it, which is just completely unnecessary. So I don't know that people really got to hear the unmistakable masterpiece that it is until much later on. The genius of this song is in its simplicity. In its best form, it's nothing more than simple acoustic guitar and John's poetic lyrics tumbling stream of conscious out of his mouth. It sounds both lyrically brilliant and completely off the wall. It makes sense and it doesn't make sense. It's the kind of abstract poetry that could mean so many things and mean nothing at the same time. He talked about how the song kind of came to him at night when he was just in bed and the words just started coming to him. It seems like he channeled the song and just channeled the energy of the song and he created it in this world. It's incredible. In the Let It Be Naked version, which I would say the best version you could hear, it's simply his vocals, his guitar, and then just washes of echoed guitar, creating that almost Indian drone type vibe to it. Basically focusing on the incredible melody, the incredible lyrics, the tone of the song itself. It's so calming. It seems like a meditation of a song. 
Jai Guru Adeva. It's like a mantra. At the time they were doing the Maharishi, they were trying to find meditation in the kind of Eastern medicine, channeling this idea of looking for that spirituality. And it's the song itself is just so spiritual. Even if the mantra means nothing, it's him trying to plead with the world. Nothing's gonna change his world. It's his own mantra of trying to calm himself down and to center himself. It's dreamlike, it's nothing like what else they've done. And it's so personal. Like, it's meant to calm John down, it's meant to center him, and it's meant to keep him going on his journey. It's a song that anyone could adopt. Nothing's gonna change my world sounds almost defeatist. You could spin it in a positive way. No matter what negative things are going on around you, nothing's gonna change your world. You could still be the same person. You could still dream your dream and believe in what you want to and try to change that world. It is otherworldly, and it's so unlike the beginning of their career. Most people probably wouldn't put it in their top five best Beatles songs, but to me, it's a pinnacle of modern music and it's absolutely transcendent. At number one, we have Hey Jude. There's so many Beatles songs that are so good. You could argue with so many different ones for number one, but I think almost every Beatle fan would say that Hey Jude is within the top 10. Such a universally loved song, and it's so iconic. The fact that this was just released as a single and didn't even make an album showed that once they created it, they just needed to share it immediately with the world. And they weren't wrong. It became an immediate smash hit. It's pop music at its finest. It's one of those examples of taking a sad song and making it better. It's the sound of this uplifting song that still has these dense, heavy lyrics. Don't carry the world upon your shoulders. Now, of course, it was written by Paul for John's son, Julian, Jules, and you could hear the warmth that permeates through the song. You could tell that he's an uncle who cares. He cares for John like he's his family. He cares for Julian like he's his family. He's a child, but he's speaking to him plainly and encouraging him to carry on, encouraging him to be his best and not worry so much about the world. It's amazing that such a long song is still played on the radio, coming in at almost seven minutes. I don't know that they've ever cut the song. To me, cutting the na-na-na is kind of sacrilegious. It's kind of the part that everyone loves. I've had the pleasure of seeing Paul McCartney live and you know he's going to play this song every time. To me, it was overwhelming seeing the song live just to see an entire stadium full of people singing along to every single word. It, it was an overwhelming experience of joy to me, and I started crying, frankly. The, the feeling of just singing along to the crowd and everyone knowing the words is what music is all about. It's really about that communal aspect and bringing people together. And to be in a crowd where everyone wants to sing the same song, it's incredible feeling. It's simply music at its best, making us feel less alone, meant to be shared and meant to be enjoyed together. It's absolutely undeniable. All right, so that was the top 10. I have to at least share two songs that are great, but just didn't make the list. One of them is Revolution. Now I'm talking about the single version, not the one from the White Album with the doo-wop, the doo -ness. The single version just absolutely rips. People always talk about Helter Skelter, how it has that hard rock feel and the distortion. But to me, Revolution is even better. That riff is just killer. And I think it's as influential as anything they've ever done. It's so hard rocking. The other one that just missed it would be All My Loving. All My Loving is just a classic older Beatles song. It's, once again, it's about two minutes long. It has incredible harmonies. It's just so catchy. And it does what they did back then so well, which is, having something that sounds old-fashioned, but just making it fresh. It's a great song, but both of them just barely missed out. Because you're still watching, I feel like I should pull a deep cut or kind of an overlook song on their catalog. It's pretty hard because the Beatles are pretty famous. So there's not as many lost gems in their catalog. Even a lot of the demos that are either on the Escher demos or Anthology, 
like Not Guilty or Child of Nature. These songs eventually were placed on their solo albums and they released them properly. So to have an, a truly overlooked song, there's not that many of them in the catalog. To me, I'm gonna shine a light on Hey Bulldog, which is from the Yellow Submarine soundtrack. Hey Bulldog, it wasn't even in the movie in the US version. Apparently it was cut out entirely. So Hey Bulldog is a random song that they put on the album but the groove is a monster, and it's piano-driven, no less. Between the piano, the guitar, and the bass, they just have this vicious riff. It rocks so hard. It sounds like such a fun song. I believe the story is that they made the song while they were creating the Lady Madonna music video, came up with this riff and went with it, and it sounds kind of like a goofy song they made on an afternoon, and it's just awesome. Really underrated song, and if you haven't really listened to it recently, you should revisit it. And now what you've been waiting for, what I think is the most overrated Beatles song. Now before I say what it is, and behind me might kind of give it away, I would like to say, the Beatles one is a strange compilation for a newbie. The fact that it has both Lady Madonna and the Ballad of John and Yoko, I don't think that's some of the best songs that a new person should listen to when they listen to the Beatles. But I guess it, it went number one at some point, those songs. Pretty good songs, maybe not their best. However, I'm here to bring down Get Back. Get Back, the Peter Jackson documentary, is a must watch. It is absolutely a Beatles fan's treasure trove. Seeing their process, seeing them together, working on songs, an absolute must watch. This is not about that. It is about the song Get Back. Even the documentary shows because of their self-imposed time limitations, Get Back doesn't have all the meat on its bone. You can see in the documentary that Paul comes up with the riff and that's about it. And that's basically what the song is. Most Beatles songs have a big shift between the verse and the chorus. Like to me, what the Beatles are is they always have these such big choruses and they're usually differentiated from what the verse is, that great dynamic. Those choruses are just so big they make you want to sing along. Get Back doesn't really have that. It takes that riff and well that's pretty much it. They just kind of have fun with the riff. It basically stays that same riff the entire song and that chorus, Get Back to Where You Once Belonged, that's it. It's like a line. It's kind of underwhelming. I could understand why they play it live a lot. Jam bands like to play it. I, that makes sense. Without Billy Preston's amazing keyboard work, I think it would kind of be lost in the annals of Beatles history. They needed songs to put on Let It Be, so Get Back was born. Is it one of their best? I hardly think it is. I feel like I'm not the only one. I feel like the backup vocals from George and John, like, get back, get back, like they could be doing anything else, but they have to sing this song. It might be a little bit because where I grew up, this was the most played Beatles song, and I don't know why. They have dozens of much better songs in my opinion. This song was just played to death. So it might be the fact that I don't want to hear it again. Get back, you could go home, I'm done with you. So there you have it. That was undeniably the top 10 best Beatles songs. So how wrong was I? Do you agree? Do you disagree? Do you think that Get Back is their best song? Let me know. If there's any artists that you'd like to see me rank, let me know in the comments below. So I hope you stick around, and thank you for watching. Um, the, uh, it, w <coughs> it, <coughs> oh jeez, okay. <laughs> is just fun. <laughs> no, I don't know. That wasn't great. <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. I'm good with this one.